this this talk involves uh, early Wildman China patterns <laughs> and a few acknowledgements. There are some pictures from the pattern books, which uh, you'll see. There's some registration pictures, which are all down to the hard work of Jerry Pierce. And uh, a number of the photos have come from either people who've sent me pictures or let me photograph them. I'd like to start off with a little bit of history. The pottery actually started in 1822 as an earthenware works. Two Elkin brothers and their brother in law, John Pitt Knight. Knight brought in the first Wildman, and uh, Henry Wildman died unexpectedly. His two sons inherited, and one of them uh, ended up bringing in the first Shelley. So 1860, Henry Wildman added a China works. At that stage, Foley Potteries had about 220 employees. There's Henry looking very prosperous, which might explain why he died unexpectedly and his wife and their residents. He died in 1864, James and Charles inherited, Charles dropped out, James became sole proprietor and they set up in 1872 Wildman and Company with Joseph Shelley joining to run the Foley China Works. Now, no pottery that I'm aware of between 1860 when they started the China Works and 72 is, has been identified, so we know nothing about it. Here's Joseph Shelley, the first one. That's in later life, but uh, he was employed for 10 years as a traveller before he was brought in to run the China Works. A traveller, I take it to be a commercial traveller uh, or a commercial salesman. And he did come from a family with a pottery background. Now, again, we know nothing about the first eight years, nothing till 1880 that we can date with certainty. And uh, in 1880, and 1882, there were two registered designs, the first things we know anything about. And the <laughs> oldest pattern, surviving pattern book starts in 1882. There's a few earlier patterns we can deduce from entries in the surviving pattern books. At this stage, we're starting in 1880 or thereabouts. Wildman, uh, was, James Wildman was still obviously the dominant partner. They had quite a big export trade and they had about a thousand employees. And I understand that that makes them a middle sized pottery. There were some that had as many as 3000 and uh, a lot of quite smaller ones as well. Now there are two registrations which supply the first patterns. Here's the first one. You can see it's a sort of basket weave pattern with uh, a whole lot of little panels they're called in the pattern books. Uh, and uh, there are, I must, the only known examples. And uh, that's because they are only marked with registration numbers. And this is a registration diamond, which is in code. In our early collecting days, we bought a copy of a book by Godden on English pottery marks, and he had decoded them. And Anne very diligently managed to have a look and found uh, the two plates. And then we found this in a car boot sale in Brighton. Uh, five pounds worth there only. I think Anne actually bargained it down to four. Can you imagine? <laughs> Brighton, England, you better say. <laughs> Brighton, England. And <laughs> these are a couple of the panels. And about half of the panels in the registration picture got recycled and added to Cloisello in the 1920s. So that's 45 odd years later. Just a brief note about the, the British registration system. They had a diamond mark. And as I said, it was in code. Uh, class four means ceramics, and then the day and the date. And eventually that takes you to the parcel number. And if you know the parcel number, you can find out which company registered it. And in 1884, they changed to a registration number. The diamond mark gave three years coverage and the five years gave five, uh, the numbers gave five years and they could be extended. And here's the second one, still before the pattern. And again, I regret to say that the only known examples that I can find. 
uh, and they're all ones that we collected. Once we got the first one, we knew what we were looking for, but again, a, a diamond registration mark. But there must be more of them out there if we can get four. Uh, I'm sure if anyone is interested in the early patents, they should be able to find more. Well, when the patent books start, there's numbers, but there's not a hell of a lot of information. And uh, they contain patent numbers, but often without any pictures. And here's the top half of the first page of the first surviving patent book. And you can see that up the top, the very first one is painted green ivy. And then there are a whole lot of entries for bird and japonica in different ways, 15 different colorways. By the second page, they have the odd picture. And on the fifth page, they actually have a picture where they say registered japonica and bird. And here's the, the mark. But as again, although there is a pattern number, they don't put it on their wares. They were satisfied with just the diamond mark. So we've got this problem. The early wares are often poorly marked. They don't have any obvious things which say Wildman and Cup. And here's an example. There's a cup and a trio. There is a patent number on the cup, nothing else on anything. Is it Wildman and Company? Well, the shape looks like Victoria, but there's a lot of other potteries made shapes very similar to Victoria. Here's one from Royal Crown Derby. The pattern number, well, it fits in with the sequence in the first pattern book, but the pattern book doesn't show a picture. It says same as 1922, which was presumably in a pattern book that no longer survives. And so that's inconclusive because there are other potteries that also used similar numbering systems for their, some of their patterns. Now, the pattern book does include down here, Victoria Handle and Mint and Saucer. Now, a Mint and Saucer happens to be the same shape pretty much as a Victoria Saucer, but with more curve. And this Saucer does in fact uh, match a Mint and Saucer, which we have positively identified. And final clincher is that there is a pattern which is illustrated three, four, nine, eight, and it looks very, very like this one. So I think it's reasonable to conclude that this is a Wildman and Company trio, an early one, even though it's very poorly marked. So how can we identify China that doesn't have a logo? We can look for early pattern numbers. They should be in that range because by the time we get to 3550, they have very largely uh, started putting Wildman and Company logos on them. We can look for known registration marks or numbers, and these have appeared in various publications, including uh, the registration marks are on our website now, so they can be checked there. The variations of known patterns, that is different colorways of existing ones, and that's how we got some of those bird ones, and likely styles of patterns, whether they are similar to patterns that we positively know, and early Wildman and Company cup shapes. And the cup shapes, there are only a few of them that were before they started marking them reasonably well. Worcester, and uh, the dates here are when they first appear in the pattern books, but uh, they may well have been in use before that. Victoria, Square, oh. Minton, and Lily Early, a few of those. But there are other potteries that make quite similar shapes to Worcester and Victoria in particular. And here's an example. This is the very first cup from the 1880 registration. You can see it had a vertical bar where the handle joined the body, but not that much later, they dropped that. And here's one of my mistakes. It has a little impress on the bottom, uh, which I thought might be W and Company. Uh, and the foliage looked a bit like Japonica on the this second one. And uh, it, when I got it home and uh, put a bit of pencil lead in the impress and had a close look at it, it turned out to be H and Company, which is Hammersley and Company. But you can see it's a very similar shape, slightly different mm. size. Right, well, let's have a look at the remaining Wildman and Company patterns. The third one, and it is mentioned, again, a pattern number in the book, which says registered apple blossom. So it's reasonable to conclude that this is it. Uh, 
but a diamond mark only. They don't bother putting the pattern number on, no Wildman and company mark. And then this one, we know only from the registration submission. Uh, we've looked at for it for some years, but uh, not found any. And I would think it would only have a diamond mark and I've recreated it because we don't have a, an example to include. The fifth registration is the first Japan pattern to be registered and the first time that they used a Wildman and Company logo over the diamond registration mark. And that pattern persisted for a few years, so it's not uncommon. This one I've included just for completeness. It's a shape registration square, and it got registered twice. Right at the end of the diamond mark system, they registered it, and then they re-registered under the number system, presumably because it gave two years more protection. And this is the second Japan pattern, mistakenly in a few books called the first Japan registered pattern, but it was the first one registered under the number system. And uh, these usually have a pattern number and they have this well-known company logo. I'll just mention in passing, there are 24 entries in the surviving pattern books, which refer to lower or earlier pattern numbers, which must have been in lost pattern books. The only three I've been able to find uh, have been these three here. This one, which is as 1992, which so uh, presumably a pattern very like that was being used before we know anything about them in the, from the pattern books and this ivy and this one. But uh, again, that list has been published some uh, years ago, I think in our, our newsletter, and I think might've been in the English newsletter, I'd have to check. But uh, anyway, uh, there must be more of them around, which would give us some indication of the earliest patterns. And one other anomaly, these Japan patterns all have t -wear numbers in the 3000s, but for some reason when they were, the pattern was used on large plates, they gave them, some of them anyway, some 500 numbers. And uh, you can understand a comport, which is really just a large plate uh, with a stand underneath would have the same number as the uh, plate, but uh, these are four that I've been able to find. There are probably more. Just a few more dates before we start looking at a few pictures. In 1881, Percy Shelley, Joseph's son joined. That's what he looked like again in later life, but he'd had a university education and he was young and he was keen and he went to America and saw that they needed to upgrade the quality of their wares. And he managed the works from 1896 to 1892. In 1884, Wyman dropped out of the China works, but kept on running his earthenware works. But once they dropped out, Wyman and company became a Shelley owned company. And that's when they really started to improve their China and uh, bring in new patterns and cup shapes and things. And Wildman closed his earthenware works in 1892 and Wildman and company after a couple of years interval uh, brought in a new, uh, put up a new earthenware works and that's when they uh, brought in some new artists and uh, they brought in uh, Frederick Reed to be their artistic director and brought in Intarsio and all those sorts of things. A quick look at the back stamps you're likely to see. This is the very first one and it had a high crown. After that, they simplified the crown a bit, but they, uh, I thought the crown shape might have some date significance, but it doesn't seem to. There's a, a number of variations of it and it seems to be whoever engraved the plate. Anything with England on it must be after 1891 because that's when the Americans insisted that any imports showed the country of origin. And they started off, it would appear only on uh, putting it on wares that were going to America, but they very soon started putting it on everything. And just a note, these early back stamps all seem to be put on on top of a clear glaze. Uh, this is a magnified view with side lighting and you can see that it's on top of the white glaze, or at least I hope you can see. But uh, when they changed and brought in an earthenware factory, when they started the earthenware factory, they redesigned their back stamps. 
And uh, this one is for China, and they drop off the China when it's for urban wear. They tried to get exclusive use of Foley for a while, but they couldn't because there were other manufacturers in the Foley district. And so in 1910, they introduced the Shelley back stamp, but the firm, although it had a Shelley back stamp, still traded as Wyman and Company right up to the mid 1920s. Now there are about 1700 pattern numbers in this 10 year period that I'm going to look at. And that doesn't mean there are that many patterns because some of them had up to 25 entries every time they used them on a different cup shape or every time they used them in a different colorway, they gave them a number. The dates that you'll see are when the patents were first listed and most of the patent names, which I've included in this, because patent names are easier to remember than patent numbers, uh, were those given by Knight and Hill. And some of those they got from patent book descriptions and some have been would seem to me invented by them. And the last bit before we look at some pictures, uh, that there is an overlap in dates between a, one book, which is the 3000s, and another book which starts at 6002. So that the very highest 4000 numbers and the lowest 6000s uh, can be contemporary. And you can have a 6000 number, which is an earlier date than a 4000s number. Well, run through a few of these. This was that registered pattern. I think it this one on a, a little dish of ours must be 3,349 because that mentions a red printed version with gold lining. Blossom we've seen before, and I'm going through these in date order. Another 1882 pattern, Sunflower. The Japan pattern we've seen before, and for some reason at that stage, some of them used a different pattern number for the plate and a different pattern number for the, uh, the cup. Japan, we've seen that before, and by then they're starting to get the stage where they're pretty regularly putting a logo on them. Another Japan on square. The ivy one we've seen before because it refers to in the pattern book, a number before the pattern book started. Now, there was a bit of a Gothic revival in Victorian times that led to a few of these formal patterns. Here's one in a couple of different colorways, which Knight and Hill have called Gothic border. Some quite pretty floral roses and clematis in two colorways. You can see change the background color. Some scenery, which I don't know what this bit is, whether it's the back of a mirror or a fan, it looks slightly oriental, but when you look at the scenes, they are pretty European. Some orchids, another pretty floral. And I don't need to name them all, but we're up to 1885 now. So that's how sparse the patterns are that I could find. But this one is called Oriental Flowers, and there seem to be two versions which had uh, very nearly the same number. Uh, this was used as a center with a board around it. And then, a bit surprising, because they seem to have been using it for a couple of years, the border itself was uh, registered several years later and used as a pattern on its own. And this pattern also got recycled. Uh, about 30 odd years later. And what surprises me is that it appears with the original registration number from 30 years before. I can't believe that they continued to pay registration fees to keep it going, but uh, either they were being a bit uh, free and easy with their registration numbers, or perhaps uh, they appeared on a plate. There are a few of these overall often called Paisley patterns. Uh, in different colorways. And this one was pretty popular. There are a fair number of them. And uh, based on a thistle, another floral. And here's a couple that 
Knight and Hill chose to call Japan patterns. I'm not so sure. They've introduced another colour. They have the traditional Japan red and either black or navy blue and some gold. But uh, and this one's much more free and easy. Uh, uh, you know, nothing like the early formal Japan patterns that were in panels and uh, so on. Some geometric border patterns. And this one in the same book is called both Blackberry and Bramble, but it came in a whole lot of different colorways as well with a fair swag of pattern numbers. And here is an early tea set. Uh, the, I don't know whether the teapot and the jug or the sugar box rather, and the, the teapot and the jug were uh, made from urbanware by in the James Wildman factory or whether they were China. But the handles look quite similar to some that James Wyman used on some of his wares. We've seen this thistle before, but it also with the same pattern number uh, appeared on square. Clover. And uh, quite pretty. You can see how they printed the pattern in brown and then they've colored in the flowers and the leaves and so on. And it must have been popular because there are 25 pattern numbers entered for this, and it came often in mono color here, uh, and also a few colored ones. Some scenery. And you can see how these were done. They've printed them in brown. When they colored them, they put a bit of blue on the water and the sky, and a bit of green on some of the land features. So it was done fairly simply. But they're at the same time as they're producing some of these more elaborate patterns, they were producing some uh, quite, I think, quite elegant uh, stylized foliage. We're up to 1887 now, and uh, this is clover in a couple of colorways. Uh, again, a pattern that was produced in a number of different colorways. And you can see how the pattern was done. But a more traditional Japan pattern, cornflowers. Now cornflowers, as I understand it, are definitely blue. They printed some without coloring the flowers in, but they also seem to have a red variety, uh, either for decorative purposes. But this one is another Japan, it's a bit more formal. And the one on the right is in our collection. We don't have a pattern number on it. And, uh, it, they took the flower here and used it, but I can't find anything in the pattern books that seem to match it. This is Dolly Varden. Now, Dolly Varden uh, is referred to in the 11 entries that two of them actually refer to Dolly Varden. Uh, now, Dolly Varden was a character in a Dickens novel and uh, a young lady who a few painters uh, rendered a couple of well-known painters. So I don't quite know how that translated over to this pattern on the right, which is on a lidded box, which I take to be something from some sort of dressing table set. Honeysuckle, another one which came in different colorways, including a colored version. Gold and silver thorns, another stylized foliage one. And you might be wondering where the silver thorns are. They have gone black, but I did carefully polish up uh, one on the back of uh, the, the cup, and lo and behold, it is silver underneath. But uh, it shows that they obviously used silver compounds in the glaze, because later on they changed to platinum-based compounds for their silver, and that doesn't tarnish. And over, uh, all over, pattern, a simplified or much simpler border. I don't know enough about oak trees to see where they got the oak border from, whether that really does look like uh, the f some flowers you get on oak. Some simple patterns were up to 1889 now. Some Japan patterns called Japan by, again, by Knight and Hill, but uh, uh, these really seem to be based on one color. Uh, I would have not called that a Japan pattern, but simply a 
foliage pattern. And they're still doing some of these uh, sort of stylized foliage and flowers. Now, jungle sheet is called jungle sheet in the pattern book, you can see there. And it came out as a number of versions, a number of colorways. And uh, another one that sometimes gets confused with it is jungle print. It was actually called daisy jungle print in the pattern books. The reason being that there are some little daisy flowers on it. And that there's the 1880 pattern, but in the mid 1920s, Cloisello ware was introduced in earthen ware. And you can see where they got the pattern from. It came from the daisies and these twisty spirals. Basket of flowers. These are what I regard a bit as Victorian type patterns where they're fairly ornate. And uh, a Japan pattern, a cabaret set here. It's missing obviously one cup and saucer, but uh, uh, and the, the trays were earthenware, large and heavy earthenware. And these are called Japans, although again, they're monocolored. They're not like the traditional Japans, whereas this one is. And it came in two versions, both with the same pattern number, but one of them they've obviously given a pink wash to the background uh, to produce this pink effect. That would require extra work. And so presumably they would have been sold for a bit more money. And these Japans, again called Japans, but they seem to me fairly free and easy compared with what was the original traditional Japans. This is uh, a simplified floral border. And chrysanthemum, monocolor, black and uh, gold. Now, I don't know quite where the sun, well, I presume these are taken to be sunflowers. I'm not sure. <laughs> they could be tops of parasols. <laughs> and some pretty geometrics. And again, more traditional Japan patterns. This is called bird's nest design. And I presume that's because of this bit in a bit of blob of black, but I'm not really sure whether it was a bird nest. <laughs> and some golden sprig panels. Another geometric quite elaborate with gilding. And another one, Rococo design, it was called. I don't think that came from the pattern book. I think that was an invented name. And this is another one of these ornate, what I would regard as Victorian type patterns. But at the same time, they were making these much, much simpler uh, sort of paired back foliage and, and flowers. And the star pattern, and this, to me, epitomizes the Victorian era with an overly elaborate shell plate shape and cup shape and a fairly fancy pattern. At the same time, though, contemporary, uh, they're producing these, which I think are rather prettier, but much simpler. This one, Dresden flowers. Another floral. A flower border, and I think they may be passion flowers, <clears throat> but they're simply called flower border. And the cup on the right is a coffee cup, which seems to have had a very short life. It was called bamboo, presumably because of the handle. And again, some fairly simple ivy. This cup shape is a Stanley, which is another coffee cup that had a very short life and seems to be fairly rare. Florals with quite elaborate gilding. And that brings me to all the pictures I can really find from this era. But in conclusion, I'd just like to sum up before 1880, we knew very, we know almost nothing about China. From 1880 to 1882, early wares often badly marked. And if they were registered under the diamond system, that seems to be all they thought that they needed as an identity. 
Uh, the pictures are on the website. If you look under about Wyoming and Shelley and under, it's got Wyoming pattern registrations. Ralph very kindly put them up the other day. The oldest surviving pattern books start. They give pattern numbers, but a lot of the early ones lack pictures and don't have a lot of information. First logo in 1883. By the mid 1880s, most pieces have Wyoming and Company logos, although sometimes sets are not well marked. You'll find that only some of the pieces have any identification on them. And I'd just like to say that Wyoming and Company obviously catered for diverse tastes. They were prepared to make some very over elaborate shapes and patterns, but they also had some quite elegant, very simple ones. And that brings me to the end.